So my interview will probably be a little different than the usual because uh, I was in the CBs. Mm -hmm. CBs stands for Construction C Battalions B. And the Navy, it was a, it was a Navy uh, operation. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I'm gonna tell you as we go along that there were, we didn't do a lot of shooting back, but sometimes we got shot at. <laughs> no, no problem, it's just more about the experience that yes. you had, so. And uh, my, the, 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 I went to a technical high school, and one of the subjects they had was surveying, which I, which is, I took as a, as a normal procedure, and uh, went and got out of high school on February 41. Now, Pearl Harbor didn't occur till December 41. So I was, I went to work, but we and learned that we were building uh, writ lots and lots of things for the war effort. Use that then we thought we were shipping it all to York. Yeah. So, uh, but it was a good thing that we were really building up, uh, getting ready because we were in the, in the middle of uh, an expansion of our ability to, to build war, war material when the Japanese uh, struck Pearl Harbor. Uh, that was, a, a, we were all kind of stunned <coughs> when that happened. But, uh, uh oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, I, I worked on a, a couple of buildings and built up my ability to do sur surveying um, the reason I'm talk, talk, telling you a little bit about the surveying is because th th that's what I was doing the whole time that I was in the service. I never shot a gun. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean I wasn't shot at. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. So it sounded really neat to uh, be building uh, down in the South Sea Islands. That sounded like something I wanted to do. So I, when I, about October of 42, I, I joined um, the, the Navy Seabees. And uh, they didn't have a place to put me until January, but I, I went in and into, inducted in January of uh, 43. That was an interesting thing because the Navy, uh, Navy didn't seem to pay any attention at all to the fact that I was at that point a surveyor, a land surveyor. Uh, because they, uh, right after boot camp, they did give me a little raise. They gave me from seaman second to, to seaman first. They put me to watching a boiler make hot water. <laughs> so, uh, but they must have watched that boiler make hot water pretty good because uh, when that time was up, they gave me a rating of ship fitter third class. Now, at that time, the CBs had not been in business very long, so they tried to adapt the Navy uh, ratings to the, the what you what the construction industry did, and a ship fitter seemed the nearest thing to a plumber, so I got to be a plumber by watching that boiler. And interestingly enough, they put me in ship's company, which means I was going to stay at Camp Perry, is where they they sent me, which was not quite completed. One of the things that wasn't completed was a, a thousand man drill hall. Thousand man drill hall requires a big bathroom, as you can imagine. And I was the ship fitter for the plumber. Now, I had never done any plumbing, but I had to build that thousand man bathroom. 
<laughs> so uh, that was my introduction into how uh, screwed up things were, which brings up the fact that there are two words that are kind of made up during World War Two. One of them is called snafu, and that definitely was a snafu. Snafu stands for, oh, yeah, we'll do this this way. Oh, situation normal. All oh, I'll use a good word, fouled up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, they put me, they said to me, okay, you're going to be the plumber in charge of building that restroom. I said, well, I can't do it all by myself. I'm going to need help. No problem. Go down to the, where they, everybody lines up in the morning and tell the officer in charge how many men you want. So the first morning I went down there and I said, I'd, I'd like to have 10 people to help me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. 10. None of them had any idea of how to do anything <laughs> like that. So I showed them what a pipe vice was because I had seen a plumber work and I showed them how to cut pipe and thread pipe. And so I proceeded then to measure what was necessary and we could tell them, okay, I need a piece of a three quarter inch pipe, 10 and a half inches long. Well, after it didn't take long to know that things just weren't fitting. Why aren't these fitting? These people didn't know how to read a rule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so every morning after that, I'd get pick, get my uh, allocation of helpers. And we first thing we'd do, we'd have a little classroom. I would teach them how to read a rule, what the little things were. And the, we, but we did build the, the, the restroom. My time at, at Camp Perry ended after 18 months and um, they formed up what a, a, the battalions had been like 65, 67, things like that that shipped out. But suddenly it's the 301st battalion, which is a whole new classification of battalions because there's this 300 and I was assigned to the 301st it's NCB Naval Construction Battalion and it's then I call this talk that I'm giving you my World War II Road to Japan because it's kind of similar to uh, how our interstate works. You drive a, a, a long way and suddenly there's a, a stop where they have stores and gasoline and all the things. Sometimes they have uh, hotels or motels. And that's the way it was uh, getting to Japan. We had, we had to have stop places to stop and regroup. Uh, now, interestingly enough, none of those places were under our control, so we had to take them from the Japanese as we went. Uh, it took seven days on the first part of the trip, seven days to go from, from Camp Perry, which was at Virginia, uh, Richmond, Virginia area, to Port Wanibi, California. Seven days across this country. Is that on a train? On a train. Now you, now you go in less than seven hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, it, it gives you an idea of the, the the how far we've we've come and things were a little different then. But it was it was an interesting ride. We called them cattle cars because they weren't exactly uh, they were special trains to cram as many people in as you as you could uh, like bunks were three or four high I can't remember exactly how many um, there wasn't a lot of headroom <laughs> so at Port Wanimi uh, 
they, they gathered us together and assigned us to a, uh, a liberty ship that was going to take us somewhere. This is another peculiarity of the service. They don't tell you a, a, a non-com. A, a non-com is a person that doesn't have a commission. Yeah. A, a, an officer is a person who's generally who's been to college. So because he's been to college, he's supposed to be smarter than the people who haven't been to college. It's not true because the people that have been to college just had them could afford to go and the others couldn't afford to go. <laughs> that was the difference. So uh, we never knew where we were going. They put us on a, a Liberty ship at Port Juan Amy. And uh, we found, after 11 days, and most of which I was seasick, uh, we landed at Pearl Harbor. Uh, now, the Japanese never occupied Pearl Harbor. They, they bombed it on, as you well know, December 7th, uh, 1941. <clears throat> And they, and that leads me to a, another important point that I believe wars are won by the people who make the fewest mistakes. Everybody makes a lot of mistakes, but the Japanese made a few more than we did. And their first major mistake was after they successfully bombed Pearl Harbor, they did not bomb the oil storage. It was on uh, the island of Oahu. Oahu is the main island, uh, is the main commercial island, not the biggest island in the Hawaiian group. Had they destroyed those oil tanks, chances are the outcome of the war would have been a great deal different, but they didn't. Uh, we were also lucky and uh, that we had some of our major ships were out of the harbor at the, at the time. Uh, I have my own personal feeling about how much Roosevelt knew and didn't know, but I suspected that, I suspect that we had a good idea what was going to happen, but we just didn't know how much they could damage Pearl Harbor. Uh, because we, these important ships were out of the harbor and never got damaged. And they were important to the Battle of Midway, for instance. Okay. So, at uh, at, at Pearl Harbor, we were assigned to a different ship called the Dalhart. This was going to be home base for the 301st that's Battalion, a C, uh, uh, the CB Battalion, and uh, another idiosyncrasy of the service is the fact that um, You'll get the message in a minute. That now to get this ship filled, we have to. You need riggers. You need people who do do cables and stuff and lifting with the, the, the lifting. And of course, I wound up on the rigging crew because my name is Rigger. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so far, I haven't done any surveying. <laughs> which I was trained to do. But it, by good fortune, one day I was in, on the ship in a, passage, in a passageway. Uh, on a ship, a hall is a passageway. So I was, and it was an open door. Why I was standing where I was, I'll never know. But I overheard one officer say to another, we need surveyors and we don't have any. So I went to the door and said, Sir, I am a surveyor. <laughs> wow. 
And at that point, I, it, everything changed. From that point, I could do what I had trained to do. And so, uh, after the ship was loaded, we went off. And they never tell a non-com anything. Like, where are you going? What are you going to do? Uh, we, we got on a ship. We had no idea where we would go. And, it, it, and they didn't tell us where we stopped, but I think it was Anawitak. It's an atoll in the Pacific Ocean. And we were there for a few days. And now I know that we were there because the Marines were, were having a hard time taking control of Guam. So, the, uh, and we were, we were going to go to Guam. So, at some point, they decided it was time for us to go. And, and, and we went the rest of the trip and, uh, to Guam. And we pulled into the bay uh, APRA Bay, A-P-R-A. -A. Uh, it was, the, the, the ship we were on was our headquarters for quite a while, while we were there. When we anchored there, and that, uh, the first day that I went to, to, to work, I was supposed to go to the, the, the inner end of this bay. And there was a, a, a lagoon, in which was just a, an open area of water, kind of surrounded by, by land, but able to get into. Uh, and I had a, a rowboat with an outboard on it. And when I got in there, the propeller hit the bottom and sheared the pin off of the, 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 the it, that's, that's a safety measure that they build into outboards. If the, the pin gets sheared off, so you don't ruin it, the propeller. The reason I tell you this is because when we were finished, where I had sheared the propeller the, the pin, there was an aircraft carrier tied up there. We deepened that water that much. That was our job. Mm. We dredged, we dredged it out. Uh, and, and we drove sheet piling down and, and put this dredged material, which was the, the coral, the, the ground up coral by then, behind the sheet piling to, to make a dock. So uh, that was our job. Now, how do we do that? And why do they need surveyors? We needed to break up this coral in the bottom of this lagoon. And to do that, you lay dynamite on it and in, in, a, in a grid, like 10 foot squares. And the surveyor on the shore would line up the, the boat that was dropping the, 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 the uh, dynamite. The, the people on the boat would take a, 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 open a box of, of, of dynamite and take out a roll of about so big. And, 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 and but the rope that they would, about the size of my finger, they would tie it a bundle and then 10 foot further on they would die another bundle and they would s string this group of th this string of dynamite uh, charges on the line that we were lining up on shore giving them where to do it when they had done a, a grid they would uh, shoot off one of these uh, charges and it would make all the rest of them go off. That was the theory. Okay. It would go up in the air, look like hundreds of feet. I don't know how far away. <laughs> but of course, when it came down, the air had already filled that hole, so it went sideways. 
and you didn't want to be anywhere near that because the, the Carl would fly up and it, it would be flying and when it hit you, you'd turn your back and co cover your neck. Uh, and that is the way it's all supposed to work. Uh, some days I was on the boat and some days I was on a shore give, telling the boat where to go. Fortunately, the, there was one day I was not on the boat because after they had laid their grid, they backed off and they, there was no way of knowing that they had backed off over an unexploded one of the dynamites and the boat vaporized with all the guys on it. Uh, that's my first kind of knowing that there was a little angel sitting on my shoulder uh, that I wasn't on the boat that day. Uh, so that procedure went on until that whole area was like 35 feet deep. And today, people take cruises to Guam uh, and the, the ships tie up at the dock that, that we built in 1945. Right. 1943 or four, three or four, 1944. Before that job was finished, they said to me and about 70 other guys, like, like I said before, we, we didn't know very much of the details. I think there was about about 70 of us. Could have been 65 or 75. And they said, get the following equipment together. You're, 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 and uh, pon we got pontoons, which are square steel tanks, like tanks. They're bigger than this, but they're about six feet by six feet by six feet. Pontoons. And you, you can hook them together to make a raft. And we had a, a, a Northwest crane with, a, a, with we, we, and equipped with the, what we call a drag line. And they said, don't bother taking any uh, shelter or food. That'll all be supplied when you get where you're going. Famous last words. And this is where I, I like to say um, there, there was two roads. One was guided by uh, or, or mapped out by MacArthur and one by the events. Yeah. And never the two should meet, but they met where we were going. It was the island of Peleliu. Have you ever heard of the island of Peleliu? Yeah. You are one of the rare people that have heard of the island of Peleliu. So, about seven days later, uh, we arrived at, at Peleliu, and we, I saw the LSTs hit, going on the beach and unloading, and, and in those days, we didn't we didn't have just radio. You pick up uh, like a phone and. Uh, it blinks lights at you. And you, you we, we had people that interpreted the lights. And uh, they, they said, who are you? <laughs> and what are you here for? So that was a, a good a sign. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, so we told them and they said, oh, you have to go around to Orange Beach. Well, Orange Beach was a um, a coral like a coral reef out from the shore a long way a couple football fields maybe I you know, I don't never knew just how wide all I know is that it was the water was at low tide was was probably about a foot deep and high tide maybe three feet deep and the the Japanese were prepared for us to come to our Orange Beach because it was the the shore was littered with dead Marines. 
it was just, and it was a good thing because all this food and shelter that was going to be there for us wasn't. So we scavenged the K rations off of the Marines, the dead Marines who weren't going to have to eat them anyhow, and their ponchos. We made shelters out of ponchos and, and lived on the, on the K rations for a while. We had eight guys out of the group have to get shipped out from malnutrition. I went down to 123 pounds because the, the MacArthur was Army and he wasn't going to feed the Navy. <laughs> There's two wars <laughs> and we didn't always cooperate with each other. Yeah. Was it MacArthur also like the Philippines and yeah, the Philippines? Yeah. Correct. And the Peleliu is about 700 miles east of the of the Philippines and the reason that we we took control of Peleliu took it away from the Japanese was he, he wanted to store a whole bunch of stuff at the nearest place that he could well 700 miles doesn't seem very near but uh, that's that was the chosen place it was going to be a warehouse and that's that was the purpose of taking Pelelu. There was no other reason, no strategic reason to do it. Pelelu is part of a, uh, of a group of islands. I think they, the name is Archipelagio. Uh, it's not the biggest island in, in the group. They've re it was at that time it was called, uh, that island was called Babelthorpe where, and there were so Japanese there, uh, but we didn't care because it was a, a, a pretty good distance of ocean and small rock islands, we call them, uh, between the two, us and them. And uh, today it's called Karur and uh, has an airport and um, hotels and it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a holiday place. It's a it's a a, a place to go. Uh, the the water is so clear, you can see down. It seems like a hundred feet and see different levels of of colored fish uh, there, and it has rock islands. It's a, it's a, it's it's a good place to visit if you like ocean stuff. But it wasn't. But Pel Peleliu was a disaster. The Marines killed on the beach, and from and the and the Japanese had changed their tactics before they had relied on what we call banzai, where uh, after the Jap the Marines had landed and uh, kind of settled in, they would all run towards the Marines with uh, uh, to, to 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 try to overrun them and kill them, um, and, and that was called a, a banzai attack. It was, the, most of the Japanese knew they were committing suicide, but that, to uh, their religion, to die as a, as a warrior for your, your country, you were also dying for your god, who happened to be the emperor too. Uh, and so they were they were dying and just dying to get into heaven. <laughs> That's, uh, so they had, they changed their tactics and they were dug in. Uh, they had expanded caves and they had uh, 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 hidden the entrances. And they, they 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 were they made it really tough and we lost four thousand Marines. But before I get to that, uh, on this orange beach at the end of it, there was a small creek coming out and a, a nice lagoon uh, in about a quarter of a mile, I would guess. And what we were there to do was to open up that creek into maybe 70 feet or 100 feet wide 
uh, enough to get barges and and small boats in and to and on one side of this we drove the, the sheet piling down and the spoils that came out of digging to fill the, that up and make it into a roadway uh, it's still there and it's used as a now uh, fishing parties and uh, and and parties uh, they, they just to go out and look down and, and see the fish in the water. Uh, I've been back a couple times there. So our job was to, to widen that and then to, 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 uh, to uh, make the lagoon deeper so that we could, they could uh, anchor uh, these barges in there. Uh, which we proceeded to do. But, uh, and when we, we shot off the, the charges, the dynamite, it would either stun or kill the fish that were around. And so we'd gather up the fish and somebody found where they could trade something for a can of lard. And so from the day that we started blasting, we had fried fish. To, that's what we lived on for quite a while. Until we got this, this channel open uh, so that you could bring barge loads in. But they had to be careful because uh, we, we hadn't yet finished with out, out beyond where they the, the vegetation went out into the ocean where it was still shallow and and they misgaged one night they day they misgaged the tide and a, a, a barge load of uh, the army the barge load of uh, had canned bacon uh, flour and sugar on it uh, and it got stuck on a, on a reef out there. Well, of course it had to be unloaded. And uh, after that, you could smell bacon cooking in our, our camp every night for quite a while. And the cooks would learn how to make bread out of the flour, but there was something wrong with the sugar because it all turned into alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, that's the fun part. Now, there also wasn't any fresh water where we were, but somehow we got a, a hold, it must have been a, 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 a moonshiner somewhere in our group because we got a, a motor, a gasoline engine, and they, they hooked up a tank on it for a vacuum, and they used the, the engine to to gener to pull a vacuum on this tank, and uh, do, so on in a vacuum, water boils at a lower temperature, and so the exhaust was enough to make the water boil in this vacuum uh, container, and the steam went up and went into the radiator, where it was cooled, and it became fresh water that we could drink. Wow. That was, now, unfortunately, the Army furnished the Marines with water when they came there, but they used barrels that had been used with oil, and they didn't get them good and clean, and there was a lot of Marines got sick and suffered, and some may have died from drinking oil-contaminated water. Uh, that's why I say that, that you, the, the Army and the Navy, they went almost like two different wars. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't cooperate very well. Now, they brought in all those supplies and they put them in behind armed guards. So, you know, while we're still existing on fried fish and what we 
it's stolen from them. Right. <laughs> they, they've got all kind of food under armed guard. Uh, this, and so we finally finished, or it was almost finished. Uh, and two things that I want to talk to you about the end, of, end there. The, the battle, the Marine part of the battle was over, and they, they were getting ready, they were going to leave, and the Army was taking over the finish up. And when the Marines came and, and they were on this causeway that we had built, and waiting, they were waiting for these little boats to come in to pick them up, little ship, uh, like barges, to pick them up. They were dead tired. I mean, and they had big packs. Two of them fell in. The Marines were so used to watching people die that they just stood there watching these two guys flounder in water. They were going to die. Fortunately, I was familiar enough to know what we had, and I, I knew where there was a rope tied on a post. And I grabbed the rope, and I went in, and I pulled those two guys out. So I, I'd love to know who, if they are still alive, oh, or what no. they did with their life. Wow. Uh, I'd like to bring this point up so that someday maybe one of them will hear this. Uh, uh, and will, will contact me. But, um, and the other thing uh, that makes a difference with me uh, is on, it was the only date that I, that I can remember. January the 23rd, 1945. I was 20 three years old by then. That was my 23rd birthday. The chief came to me and he said, Rigger, get your stuff together and go up to the airport, air, air, air strip. There'll be a plane waiting there for you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I did what he told me to do. I got my stuff together, put it in my sea bag and on my shoulder and walked up to the strip. And sure enough, there's a DC-3. That's a two-engine transport plane. And it was, I was the only one on it other than the, the, the pilot and the co-pilot. Which I think makes me the only land-based serviceman the, to be in the, the Battle of Guam, Kelly Lou, and where we're going next, Iwo Jima. So when the plane landed, it was landed back at Guam. And when they gave me a heavier jacket than I had needed anywhere else, I knew we were going north. And this was, uh, that's the only thing I knew. And it, we, we went, uh, was there a couple, it seems to me, a couple of weeks at, at Guam, uh, just kind of, just kind of being there. And uh, we, we, we put us on what looked to me like a very large yacht. And uh, uh, no guns on it, nothing. But uh, that was... It, we didn't need it. <laughs> it was a, it was too small of a ship for the Japanese to even worry with, I guess, whatever, why they didn't escort us. But like the third morning, uh, I heard thunder, I thought, and I thought, that's weird. I don't, thunder usually comes in the evening. And I went up on deck and I saw a sight that uh, had never seen before and hope never have to see again but there were big ships and the thunder was them shooting at this brown rock that's what it looked like a huge brown rock 
and it was um, uh, the, and then and there were little smaller boats going towards the shore from it from some of the ships not the ones that's doing the shooting and, and coming back and we were at Iwo Jima uh, I'm going to turn it off for a second. 23. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, 1923 I was born. Yeah. Or I guess that works out. Yeah. Uh, 40. <laughs> I, I, it, I, it's a little, a little I, it's hard to keep track of things. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, well, okay, so we were, uh, so we arrived at Iwo Jima, which now makes, with, with the fact that I was the only one on that plane, only passenger, and the only, apparently, the only one ever to go. I think I'm the only living or dead uh, what, what am I? Per, uh, ser, service man that uh, served in on the Battle of Guam, Peleliu, and Iwo Jima. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about I Iwo Jima. <laughs> Uh, we were assigned to go to Blue Beach, which is the opposite end of the beach from Mount Sarabachi. Sarabachi was, uh, I think they called it Red Beach at that end. Blue Beach, uh, there was a, uh, it was a jutting out of the kind of, of, of the beach. And somebody called it a boat basin. Well, it just really, really wasn't a, a good boat basin. Uh, they were just, but that's what they named it. And there happened to be a Jap LST. A, an LST stands for landing ship tank. The, you put tanks with trucks on a on a, a ship, and when it goes ashore, you can lower the bow, and it becomes a a, a way to just ride off onto the land. There was a Jap LST at Blue Beach on an angle, and in that, that was a fortunate thing because in that angle, you could take a warm bath in the ocean because the volcano island warmed the water enough and there was, it was shielded by this LST. Um, we were assigned to, uh, to try to see if we could build some kind of uh, docking facility there. And our job was, at first, to jet down in the beach to see how far we'd have to go to get to something solid. Well, I don't know how much you know about Iwo Jima, but the beach is not sandy color, no, it's black. black yeah. yeah. And so it's cinders, and that's the, the cinders have been ground up by the action of the waves going back and forth over them all the time. So to do what we had to do, we had a, uh, a anchored, uh, and we had brought this with us, a, a duck, a duck, is, is, a, is a truck that's equipped to go on water. You, are you familiar with the duck? Uh, it's like the amphibious truck, the, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Amphibious truck. They call them ducks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they don't spell it with a K, but uh, okay. Anyhow, we had one of those, and on, on it was mounted a, a pump, a gasoline-driven pump. And uh, the... We, were, we anchored it maybe 50 yards offshore uh, and ran a, a, a 
hose in from there to the beach and we were jetting down through the sand to see how far we'd had to go to get to something solid. Uh, and in this process, now remember I said that the, the, the island jutted outward a little bit and at the same time it was like, a, like more like a, a bluff, a cliff, uh, where it jutted out. Uh, and there were there were some holes in there. It looked, looked like they were holes. And so, uh, while we're jetting down one, one morning, and I don't know whether it was the first morning or the third or what it was, was uh, the pump stopped on this duck. And so the chief said to me, Rigger, go out and get that pump started, of course, you know, you know how to start, but I knew what he wanted me to, to try. <laughs> so I, I got on the Jap LST and went to midships where there was a ladder down over the side and from uh, this ladder to the, the duck was a rope and there was a, a rowboat there. But instead of rowing to it, you just pull yourself on the rope over to the, the dock, which I did. And and I I was trying to see what I could do to get this engine started. Uh, and I saw water splashing around me and I thought, these jerks are on a, showing pebbles. They don't have anything else to do. Well, when one of those came through the side of the the uh, duck, I decided that somebody was shooting at me. They weren't, they mm -hmm. weren't uh, throwing pebbles, <laughs> and it wasn't our guys. Yeah. Wow. So, so I decided it was time to get out of there. And it was, they were what it was. It was they were the Japanese shooting from those holes in that cliff, in that bluff, and the. I jumped into the rowboat and I started to pull myself over and I could see the both sides the water pop mm -hmm. up where they were shooting at me. Up the side of the ship I could hear ping, ping, ping. Never hit me. <laughs> That's another time I knew mm -hmm. I had this little angel on my shoulder. So I'm completely blank what we did to correct this this after that, but that uh, is one of the things that happened on Iwo Jima that I distinctly remember. Another thing, uh, while we were doing this on the shore, you know, the, 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 we went up, there was a little bluff, you know, I call it, the, the hillside, and right up the, the ridge, we were another part of our crew was building a Quonset hut. A Quonset hut is a, is a half round corrugated iron a building that uh, you use for many things. In this case, we were going to use it for mess hall. Uh, on the other side of this hut, it, 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 as I said, it was a bluff, then it kind of tapered down. There was a, a group of somebody, I don't know, another group that had nothing to do with us. And then they had been storing that we'd uh, dynamite and TNT. Uh, and one morning, I, at uh, it's time to get up. I, I forget now whether somebody blew a boo or what it was that we knew it was time to get up. As I leaned down to to tie my shoe, that dump of explosives went off. Mm -hmm. Hit the Quonset hut, like putting your heel in a tin can. And the blast, my tent was next to the Quonset hut. The blast went over me. It knocked me to the other side of the tent. But people on beyond me got carted off to the hospital. 
this is this another time oh, wow. this little angel's up here on my shoulder uh we don't know and we never will know what set off that dump whether it was a japanese or whether it was a guard that thought so you saw something move in the sunrise or we just don't know but we know that it went off uh is it a lot of people is there's a little disagreement i don't know if have you read byron uh o'brien rig's book about uh um what was the fellow's name you mentioned oh herschel williams herschel the, the medal of honor it's, no, the book's called read. the flamethrower no i haven't read it okay well Rig wrote a, Brian wrote a, a, a book about the Medal of Honor and, and they called it the Flamethrower. Um, and in it, he, he says that, that the Japanese dug 11 miles of tunnels throughout that island. I don't think he's right. I think that and, and there's my reasons for thinking that is twofold. One, while we still owned that island, and I don't know whether it's changed now, but we, we built a, um, or the Koreans did, built a monument to 7,000 Marines, uh, Korean slaves that dug sulfur in a mine that the that those that 11 miles of caves which uh, that were dug were really dug by korean slaves and they're, they're, they're and my reason for believing that's the way it was more than as well as anything there is none of this spoils which is what they call when a, you dig a mine and whatever isn't what you want, you, it's called spoils. There's no, 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 there was nothing on the surface. So what they dug was the, the sulfur ore that they took back to Japan to use to make gunpowder. Sulfur is a, an element in, in gunpowder. So, uh, the, Now, the island, it's well known, is riddled with these caves, but we didn't know that when we attacked. We didn't have any idea of that. At least me and one other guy found a hole about that big. I was skinnier then. And we went down in this hole and it opened up into a, a tunnel about half the size of this room. <laughs> wow. Um, at the base of it, there were two bodies. Uh, one was obviously a naval officer, Japanese naval officer. Another was of a, a woman. I don't know whether it's a girl, woman, older woman, or, or what. But Karabachi was famous for having comfort women these were he, he's he he's guilty of thousands of Chinese and wherever he went uh, his, his men were just turned loose uh, to, to do whatever they wanted so but there was that one body so but the the naval officer I figured well he's got I uh, went now, this hole was not very big, but I was still pretty small. And so I could get down in the hole by holding my hand over my head. Dumb thing to do, but I did. And another guy went with me. And when I turned this Japanese body over to get at his sword and other things, the landmine didn't go off. Wow. He was he was booby trapped. 
Mm. But apparently the body fluids had penetrated the trigger and get, you gummed it up so, so that that little angel was really busy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, we eventually gave up trying to build, uh, find any way to build a uh, docking facility at that place. And we moved to the other side of the island. This was after the the battle was over. There were still Japanese uh, underground. I don't know if everybody knew that. I knew it because in the morning you could we would see footprints with split toe. Japanese wore a, a, a shoe that had their f four toes in one section, but the, there's a name for them, and I don't remember oh. that. And and you can tell that the, you could tell there were Japanese footprints in the in the in the black sand around our tents. They came looking for food, I'm sure. Hmm. Uh, so, well after all the major shooting was over, there were still a lot of Japanese there. And we moved to the other side of the island, and we built a, a new camp. Um, because there was an area of relatively shallow water out from the the beach, and it was thought that we could build breakwater on each on it, and then deepen the middle to bring a, a ship in. This was the theory, anyhow. But we first had to build a camp. Uh, and what we and there, there was no spring, uh, you know, no running water or that kind of stuff. But we drilled a well, and we found water, and we took one of those pontoons that I told you about. That's this big square thing, and put it on a tower over this well, and we would pump the water up into this tower in 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 the afternoon and let it cool overnight so we could cool enough to take a shower in the morning. It was so, the, the water is so hot when it came out of the ground. That was an interesting thing. Somewhere around here, I have a picture of that tower. I don't, didn't have time today to, to dig it out, but it was an excellent spot for me to get up on with my transit and because we needed to survey this body of water that's off the, the beach from where we were camped, where we built the camp, because that was supposed to be where this docking facility was going to be. And the procedure was that we had a, a, a small boat, it's like a 30 foot boat, and a motor boat, and it had a collapsible it was like a, 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 a barrel. It was maybe that tall and that big around. It was made out of canvas. And the idea was it was on a pole on this boat. And it, the, the, the boat would go try to go on a line and every 30 seconds it would drop that, uh, that, that it would let that thing collapse. When it collapsed, we were supposed to be lined up, I was supposed to be lined up with it on my transit, and somebody down the beach with their transit, and where the two lines cross, the boat would take the, the depth. So we were mapping the water there for this docking procedure. And then when we had finished mapping, it would be brought concrete barges there and blew the bottoms out with dynamite and then filled them up with sand to make a, a, the sides of this thing. Only thing is the next day a typhoon came along and moved them all over the place. So that was another failure. So there's still 
at this time is no good place to, to bring a, a ship or a, a, of any size to Iwo Jima other than a landing ship. But while I'm still up on this this tower, this this square pontoon with my transit, I see a, 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 a smaller warship coming parallel to the beach. And I usually save this till the last, but I'm gonna throw it in there. And I, I say to myself, hmm, that's the kind of ship my brother's on. But he's in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, escorting uh, transports to, to the other war in Germany and stuff. But I, as it got closer, I said, I wonder what the number is. And Lord, there's number 50 on the sign. It's the ship my brother's on. So I climbed, I deserted my position. I just climbed down off of that tower and hitched a ride on a small boat out to that boat. And the ladder was down, so I, I, I went up the ladder and said, uh, asked for permission to board. And the officer of the deck said, yeah, all right, well, what, what are you here for? I said, I think my brother's on this ship. He says, well, what's his name? I said, Rigger. He said, oh yeah, he's down in the, in the uh, engine room. And the other side of this whole world, I had a visit with my brother. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> that is kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, during the time that, was, and I, I can't remember the day one or what day it was, but while we were on the island, we would see these B-29s come over in a formation. Uh, Guam, Thai, uh, Saipan, and Tinian are the Marianas, and they're right close together. And each one of them has an airfield, or we built airfields, the CBs built airfields on them. After the Marines cleared the, the Japanese off of them. And we brought the B-29s there. And their mission was to fly uh, 1,500 miles uh, to Japan and back. And Iwo Jima happens to be just halfway. So that Iwo Jima, at first when we took it, was at least going to be a place uh, that they could uh, ditch the plane. They could parachute out and let the plane go into the ocean. And, and we, in small boats, would pick up the, the men. And, and that's what did happen. It happened for a long time. Uh, Sometimes the planes weren't fit to land, and they would, and they were afraid they couldn't make it back to Guam. So even after we built an airport, which other CBs were building the airport while the fighting was still going on, uh, so um, the 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 planes that didn't think they could land safely whether it was at Iwo Jima or, or back, or they did, if they could make it to Guam, the people would parachute out the, the ones that were, were fit, that, that weren't, weren't already dead. And then they would, their boats would pick them up. There would be a group of smaller ships and, small, and boats to, to pick up the, they'd go right to where the parachutist was coming down and, and, and pick them up. That was one major purpose of taking the island. It, 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 in the, it, it, it would be a failure if that was, if you go by numbers, if you 
think in, in, in that term because the number of, of people that we picked up would probably be in the hundreds, but there were 30,000 casualties on the island, 7,000 dead Marines. One of my jobs was to help lay out the, the, the cemetery. And uh, it was a pretty, uh, pretty interesting way they did it. They did, you know, here we dig a hole and put a casket in. There we took a, a, a equipment, a road building equipment to dig a long ditch. And we, we identified where we were going to put crosses or, or uh, Star of Davids. And they would lay the body in there and then cover it up. Uh, that's that. And that completed cemetery looked like a wheat field. It was pretty uh, impressive. It's not a good word for it. It, it was, it was, it was, it made you feel really sad. Mm -hmm. um, There was, there's been questions of whether it was worth 30,000 casualties uh, to take to that island uh, because we didn't save that many uh, men that were flying B-29s. But what is forgotten is we didn't know if the atom bomb was going to work. We didn't know, and none of us knew, that there was even an atom bomb being experimented on. So, but the fact that it worked and devastated uh, first one city and then the next because the Japanese were too hard-headed to give up after just one city, uh, the, the, that was a... Then the argument, we, did we make a mistake in taking Iwo Jima? But if the atom bomb hadn't worked, we thought we were going to have a million casualties taking the main island of Japan. And we needed to have, as best we could, the nearest place to have a field hospital would have been Iwo Jima, 750 miles away from there were at least it could get them there as quick quicker than taking them back three thousand miles. Uh, so uh, that was uh, that was one reason was to save the uh, the B twenty nine crews. Another reason was to have a field hospital. Now. The a third reason was uh, our Mustangs. There was the name of the airplane, uh, uh, P-51 or whatever it was. They could go with wing tanks. They could get to from Iwo Jima to Tokyo and back. And, and some of them had the dead, what they call dead stick land because they were out of gas. Uh, by the time they got back, but the, they escorted. They were able to escort the B twenty nines. The B twenty nines would I'd see them come over, and and uh, uh, I remember one day I saw so many. I said, "This war can't last much longer." But it would. They would come over in, in big formation, and then an a, a hour and a half or so later, the. The Mustangs would take off, and they would they would meet when they got to Japan because the Mustangs were faster. Oh, uh, and they would protect them against the Zeros. Now I'm going to drop back when I said Zeros. I'm going to drop back to Peleliu. One day when I was fooling around in the jungle, I don't know why I was. 
you go to, to apparently work it. We were almost finished, but I was. I, there was a a Japanese Zero is the name of the airplane crashed in the jungle, and I I looked at it carefully. Inside, all over the inside was the aluminum. A L C O A, Alco aluminum. They zero planes were made from aluminum that came from the United States. So, now I think that's an important factor that we were we we, we were we were arming both sides. We still do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, The, the, the Zero was a, a good plane, but the Mustang was good also. And that, and uh, they, they protect, were good protection for the B-29s. Uh, that was another, so that was another reason to have, to take the island was to have that protection. A little known reason was that we, we did have uh, the, the Iwo Jima is kind of on the way to Hiroshima and uh, if the Anola Gay were to have mechanical difficulties uh, the plan was to have them land at Iwo Jima and we had a, built the facilities to move the bomb from one plane to another B-29, uh, which was brought there and kept there for that very purpose. So it's a little known fact that you've got in your, your you will have in your notes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other special things, but I'm about run out of, of, of uh, telling you that. I was there probably till November, and the war was over in September, and uh, that I'm here to answer any questions you might have. All right, um, so let's see, uh, where were you born? Where? Yeah. Baltimore. Okay. Uh, 1907 Clifton Avenue, second floor, front bedroom. Wow. <laughs> we didn't go to hospitals in those days. Doctor came to the house. <laughs> and, let's see. and you were in the 301st Naval Construction Battalion? 301st. Yeah. You look awful familiar. I do? Yeah. <laughs> we Have we met somebody? I don't think so. Some people say I look like Madeline Kahn or Winona yeah, Ryder now. So do you think that Maryland got their area code 301 from you guys? Uh, no, that's not even... I good. think it's a, a... I was just curious. I don't ever know. I think it's a... a, a just a... Fluke? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what happened to the two hundreds. Yeah, you know they, they they never got to they never got to one hundred ninety nine. I never heard of anything that big. So yeah. they just skipped over the two hundreds. They went from the uh, up to a, uh, a hundred and something, uh, and they went to to uh, the three hundred and first. I, at, while I was, during the war, I was never up on Mount Sarabachi. I have been back a couple times and I've been up there, but, um, and it's, it, it was, it was a very, um, advantageous place.
place to be if you were wanting to shoot at somebody because you could you could see down on the whole island from there. Um, so how what was it like growing up in the Great Depression and do you remember any experiences? That's, with that? it, 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 that's interesting. Uh, my formative years were from the beginning of the Depression, 1929. I was six years old. I figured from that's your formative years are from six to 18, and uh, so uh, I'm a tightwad. <laughs> I uh, I remember when it was that uh, it. It, it, it was um, it was very different. Uh, it wasn't that we it didn't enjoy ourselves because we did we could play ball, but it was usually a softball, you know, uh, not, not, not 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 a hard ball because none of us had gloves. Or maybe the catcher did, if, you, if we was lucky. Uh, when, and if he knocked the cover off a ball, we wrapped tar tape around it. And um, stamps were two cents. We didn't. Uh, we moved. Uh, we we were living in Detroit at the time. My father had gotten transferred to Detroit, uh, and at 1929. Uh, when the crash hit, we were living there. Uh, and uh, he lost his job. So we, we came back. And we lived in Pimlico then. Uh, we lived in three different houses. And I'm sure that uh, the first two we left because we couldn't pay the rent. Uh, to give you an idea of how things were, uh, the, the second house that we lived in was a, a row house across the street from the main entrance to the, the Pimlico racetrack. And that was a good spot to be in because uh, I was able to park a couple cars in the backyard to make a couple dollars. <laughs> that was big money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we had a, in row houses, you had an alley between, that went down between the two backyards. Uh, and you put your, your trash and garbage uh, at the back end of there, and the, and the, tr the truck came down the alley and picked it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, when my father couldn't get a job, period, uh, he went to the welfare people and uh, they gave him work to do. They did. It wasn't like today where they just give you money. They gave him work to do and they paid him in a little bit of money and they gave food. And the food came in olive drab cans with the stenciled what was in it, corn or beans, I'm pretty sure there was, they labeled it somehow. But anyhow, you could tell that was welfare cans. There's no question about that. So when we used them, my mother would put them in a, in a bag and give me the bag to take down the alley and put it in somebody else's trash so people didn't know we were on welfare. Wow. <laughs> uh, Car fare was five cents. I, we could, Baltimore had a good system of uh, electric driven, uh, what we call trolleys or street cars. They were like, uh, like buses, only they were on tracks. Mm -hmm. Just a, a single, single car about I don't, know how, I don't remember how long, maybe 50 feet. They would see quite a few people. But the, the, the routes, 
you could transfer to different routes and you could go like from, I don't know how familiar you are, but you could go from Towson to Cadenceville uh, or you could go down to uh, Dundalk. Any, anywhere, you, you could really get the most anywhere you wanted to get by close enough to walk the rest of the way by streetcar. I, we lived in Pimlico at the time that I became a teenager. Uh, and fortunately I could walk to Garrison Junior High School. It was only a couple miles. Uh, but I wanted to go to Poly. I don't know whether you're familiar or not with Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, but it's, it was a different school. It's still a good school but it was a different school then. It was a, most colleges let you in to the second year if you graduated from there. Uh, because it was, uh, we had no study periods. It was strictly learning periods. But they, they had shops. One of the shops was surveying. Uh, I had a, a course in surveying, like I told you. But I also had a, 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 I'm drifting a little bit from what you wanted to hear, but I had a, a course in uh, how to, a, a, a carpentry, um, a drawing, mechanical drawing. Uh, they had a course in um, um, a, like blacksmith type work, where how to anneal or, or, or Opposite of kneeling, <laughs> of metal, uh, all kinds of things that we were, uh, had boil, how to tend a boiler, which is probably a good thing <laughs> since I got in the navy. I had to do that. It was a, it was a, it was a, it taught us the things that were important to those days. The the, the most modern tool was a slide rule. By, uh, it, was, it, was, it was about this this wide, and it had a, a piece that slid on it. It was like on a track, and you could multiply and divide with it. You, uh, you do calculations with this slide rule. Uh, so everybody that was rich enough would have one sticking out of their pocket. Uh, but the Streetcars cost five cents. You could go anywhere you wanted to. They gave you a transfer uh, to go from one to the other. So from Pimlico, where we we lived, to Polly, it was too far to walk. It was miles. So, and downtown, it was on North Avenue at the time. And so, uh, it would cost, 50 cents for me to go to school a week. And that was not easy to get to, for my mother to get together. <laughs> that's, that's living in what's like in the depression. Um, I remember um, setting up a snowball stand and snowball was three cents, one flavor and four cents for a diff or a couple of extra squirts, right. <laughs> things like that. Uh, uh, and, but it cost a nickel to, for me to go to school and a nickel to come back. And uh, my mother had to scratch to get that 50 cents together. About 50 years later, we had a class reunion and one of the fellows said to me, he said, you were always, I remember you, you were always neat, but you had patches of, of leather, like leather patches on your sleeves of your sweater. And that was, that was true. When, when the, when the uh, sweater wore out, my mother put this, not this nice patch on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, How was it? Okay, we had a garage 
there wasn't any car in it, but so we we um, put a. I don't know how we got the fence around it, but we we would put a fence out from the door, and we we had chickens, and um, for some reason we we. Uh, We had one one rooster. He was a mean guy. He would he would spur you if you turned your back on him. But we he was he became the a household pet. But Sunday dinner without meat would not have been Sunday dinner, and we didn't have enough money to buy any meat that week. And they decided, and they and this this rooster's name was Dick. So, <laughs> Poor Dick. my mother or father decided that we would eat Dick, and so we did. We we they they cut his head off. And he ran around a while, and then they they fixed him up. The chickens will run around without a head, and then then he became a chicken like you see in a grocery store. And but I couldn't eat him. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't eat him. That's what, that's what depression is like. It is not a lot of fun. But uh, we did a lot of interesting things. One of the first places that I, when we moved here from Detroit, was uh, at Winter Avenue, which it would need nothing to you, but it was and Glen Avenue wouldn't, but Glen Avenue was kind of like the end of development. Uh, and from there out was, for a long way, was um, woods. And, it, and there was a stream that ran in, like in the middle of woods. And I can remember we, we uh, damming that up and, and making a, a place to swim. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of things that we did. Uh, we, we flew kites, um, but we made the kites. Uh, and it was, uh, I, don't, I, mean, I don't remember where we got the string. Uh, there just was no organized, uh, all, all these games, if we played ball, we just, it, it was, uh, there were no adults there. It was all kids. And uh, if there was a, a tight play, well, well, we might have a little fight. <laughs> but then we'd wind up being okay. <laughs> after, after, after the fight, we got okay. Uh, we didn't use umpires because, unless there was an odd guy. And then if, there, if we had an odd guy, then it took turns being the umpire. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. And it was, we didn't play hardball because you had to have gloves. So we played uh, softball. We called them indoor, but uh, it was ball about that big. And uh, if we had a glove, the catcher had that. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but it was, it was just played like any other ball. You'd, uh, game you'd had you hit it with a bat and you, you run to the bases and uh, but all you needed was a bat and a ball and 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 a group of kids yeah. this is a little braggadocious so I'm going to tell you the third house that we lived in it was a semi-detached which means there's two houses and a, a wall between was just a regular wooden wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, our side, from there up for half a mile, uh, was woods. And diagonally from us, across this woods, was the elementary school. So there was a little path through there. And I went to that elementary school when I lived in a different house, but uh, in this one, 
But what, I don't know what drove me to do this, but I, this is, I say bragging. I was, I was learning how to throw a, a knife or something and have it stick in, a, in, in wood. And I was, uh, some things never change. There were people always looking for trouble. <laughs> and one day I was coming down that diagonal uh, path and about halfway through, here's a, a group of another neighborhood. And so they, they were, uh, I knew there was gonna be a challenge. <laughs> Fortunately, they were, they were all involved in throwing this, I think it was a, a hatchet, at this tree to see if they, who could stick it in there. And they were ready to beat me up, but I, I picked up the, the hatchet by the off the, the tree and walked. I had learned how to pace a certain number of paces, and then throw. And then when I did, I threw it, and it boing, it stuck in the tree. And I walked away. They didn't beat me up, <laughs> <laughs> but there. Anything for entertainment, it seems like. Even if it was just uh, having a fight. Yeah. Uh, um, a couple of miles from that, uh, that house, there was, uh, it, like I said, Glen Avenue was woods. There was a couple, about, a mile or two beyond that, there was a road. And uh, somebody had built an, uh, an airfield there, just a, a dirt, straight out dirt. But the, the, we used to go there because we had found a clay pit. We could, modeling clay was the dig it there. But anyhow, uh, you, I can remember uh, a guy, uh, I almost remember his name now, but he brought three engine planes made by Ford. The Ford, same company that built automobiles, built these three engine planes. And he took them from dirt uh, runways, different places, and he would, he would sell a ride Two dollars. Yeah, it take you up and fly around, fly around a little bit, and and and, and land. That was my first. I, I got, of course, I never had two dollars to 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 uh, go for a ride, but uh, it was my first being close to an airplane. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think what else I can tell you about what it was like in those days. Um, uh, you could buy candy for anywhere from a penny to a nickel. You know, ice cream for five cents. Uh, uh, I know one thing. My father got a job and he was manager of, of, of this beer company. Now this beer company was nothing more than a, a two-story building. The first floor was a big garage, like, and the second floor had a couple of rooms on it. And they didn't make the beer. Arrow Brewery was a big deal. They made Arrow beer in their bottles and they sold it, but they also, sold some of it to this company called Hopheiser. And I can remember people arguing which was better, but it was all the same. <laughs> but one day, now, one summer, my father let me got, go to work there. 
My job was to fix the beer cases that were made out of wood. The, the ends were three quarter inch. And they had a little hole in them for picking up. And the, the sides and the bottoms were like quarter inch. And they were a metal band around the ends after you put the boards, the thin boards on the end pieces, you wrapped them, put this metal band to hold it all together better. And I got five cents for each case that I repaired. And uh, I'd take the, the metal strips off, take the broken board off, and put the good board there and put metal strips back. Some were more broken pieces than others. But I got it five cents for each case. And the best I could get, get to was a, a, a dollar a day. Uh, one day, while I was doing this, a man, I suppose now, he, he, he seemed like a grown man to me, but he was, he was about 20 some years old. And he, he, had, he said something about a cooper, and I said, no, my name's Rigger. I didn't know what a cooper was, but a cooper is a, is a, is a, a person who works on beer cases. Right. <laughs> so, uh, he's, he asked me a few questions. He says, you know, how, how, much, how much you get? And I told him, and then I t told him I could, he got it up to making a dollar a day. He's, and he would have liked to have that job. He's a college graduate, and he wanted, he would have been happy to get a job making a dollar a day. That's, these are the questions you're asking about the depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's tells you something. Uh, yeah. In those, in those days, my grandfather was one of. The, uh, like a pioneer in making screens, window screens, only they were made out of wood. And there was no such thing as air condition. Schools didn't have it, uh, houses didn't have it, it wasn't invented. Uh, in the summer, you opened the windows, the flies flew in, the flies flew out, until you had enough money to buy screens. And my grandfather was in the was a pioneer in the business of making screens, and I helped him another summer. And uh, uh, that was I thought that was interesting that uh, I lived during the time when when it was fashionable to keep the flies out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. There was a. It's, it's, it's really hard to, to paint a picture of how different it is today. Yeah. Uh, when it was hot, you opened the windows. There was no such thing as cooling. Nobody. I mean, office buildings, school buildings, there was, it wasn't invented yet. Yeah. Trying to think of other interesting things to about that I could tell you about depression times, but uh, I mean, I have a couple other questions. Go right uh, ahead. Um, do you remember hearing anything about um, like the Nazi invasion in Europe? The what? Do you remember hearing anything about the Nazi invasion in Europe while you were at school? I was always in a, in in the Pacific. Well, did you hear anything while you were at the home front, like while you were in school, about like the war going on there? Or we we uh, yeah uh, well remember now, um, uh, I don't th I the war even uh, there was a war going on. 
towards the end of my school time, uh, I don't, and and you know, I I don't remember a whole lot about it, about that. No. Uh, the problem was that. First of all, news. You did not have television. You had limited radio. You had two or three stations. And uh, it, oh, the only news that I remember getting from those stations was if something very, very special happened. They didn't have like a, a, a news station like they now have on uh, your radio. Yeah. Uh, so, unless something big happened, we didn't hear about it. Okay. It, later on, uh, when we, we kind of got involved, uh, they had, uh, we were supposed to cover up our lights, not let any lights show through, so we didn't form a target because we thought that they could get airplanes to go there for. There was all kind of rumors about uh, submarine Jap uh, German submarines coming up in the harbor and things like that. But I don't know that they ever did, and nobody ever really saw them, and we haven't found any. Yeah. Uh, so, however, I know that ships were sunk right off of the coast, so they, they did come to our coast. Uh, but I don't think they came in our, in our tributary, tributaries. Um, sorry, I just have to look through my questions. Um, so did any of your other friends join the armed services during wartime? Um, or were you like the only one in your group, like your friend group? While we were in, we, uh, each of those islands that I went to, uh, as I told you, that when I went to Iwo, I, it was me that went from Peleliu. So it was a totally different group oh. than Peleliu. Uh, and, and the group that was chosen to go to Peleliu from Guam wasn't chosen by who was friends. They were chosen by what they did. And, and I, I, I didn't really, I got pushed, I didn't, I wasn't in a position to be with the same people for long periods of time, like some train with them and you know really get to know them. So I only knew a couple of guys, and that faded pretty quickly after the war. I I got out of the, of the, uh, Chris, just before Christmas. Of uh, forty-five, was it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was very shortly after that that I went into business. I I didn't want to be working for anybody else, never again. Yeah. And so uh, I I started a business. Uh, Started out in home improvements, and then I got to building. Uh, I was lucky. Uh, my father knew, of, uh, heard of, from a friend of his that uh, they wanted to build a, a building in Cockeysville, and I met this other one of the three owners. <coughs> that, 
owners to be, and he was a Marine captain. Well, the Marines and the Seabees were like this, because we were older, and we were we had food and, and other things that they didn't normally have, and so they liked us, and we liked them, because they protected us as we did our work. Well, this captain and I hit it off, and I remember they <clears throat> agreed to build a 60 by 100 foot building for him for a uh, cost plus a $1,000. Uh, and that started me to in industrial building. And uh, there's hardly any place you go now between here and Northern Virginia and as far north as uh, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And I, I, I built, I built half a dozen churches and I built all uh, a lot of the volunteer fire departments around here, uh, and uh, got into building swimming pools. And uh, I thought in the 1950s, this is this is a common thing, and so I was a kind of a pioneer here. On that, they were already in big deal in, on the West Coast. Yeah, and uh, so I became. They called me Mr. Swimming Pool, and I built, built uh, uh, a bunch of not little pools like this one, but and I own a, a thirty-acre uh, swim club right now. Oh, huh. yeah, we have six pools and. Um, like we had a Mother's Day brunch in our hall that uh, seats a couple hundred people. <laughs> we have weddings and all kinds of things like that. That's great. Is it in Maryland? It's nearby in Maryland. Right here, yeah. Okay. Uh, this, this this is a valley from yeah. here down. You pass this across oh. the stream and run across the bridge. Yeah. When you go up on the other side, there was a, a traffic signal, Pedonia Road. Well, okay. the club's called Pedonia Park. Okay. And it's 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 just off of that road, about a mile down. Very nice. Yeah. Um. So, the Seabees, you know, helped me continue to 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 want to be a builder. <laughs> uh, it was in my in my blood anyhow because uh, I can remember uh, in that, I told you about that woods that and the and stream at the in part of build taking rocks and building a dam so we have a place to swim. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just kind of go ahead. <laughs> um. So uh, what is there any message you want to lead to future generations? Yeah. <laughs> Cut the wokeism. <laughs> oh. Once I, I, I think we're doomed, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, how shall I put it? We really need to, to, to do things for ourselves. Uh, not expect a uh, government to do it for us. Government is nothing more than, than other people who want to take advantage of, of a situation. And they, they, they offer to do stuff for you, but you pay for it. You have no idea what you're facing in 
taxes soon. Uh, what, what looks like a, a, a good thing right now is going to cost. It's going to cost something fierce. I'm worried about it. Um, we, we just made a... I know our, our former president was not the nicest guy in the world. People didn't care for his him personally. But um, what we what we what we've done now is to wipe out all the good things that he did do, and uh, uh, I don't know what to tell how how to tell a young person what to do because uh, I'm I'm afraid for it. Um, in a way, I'm glad I'm at the end of the road, but I'm sorry that I, I've, I've got a younger wife. She's, she's 30 years younger, and she's all playing golf right now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect day. She, she had, she, she's got two hole-in-ones to her credit. So, <laughs> so but she, I'm worried about because any amount of money that I leave now uh, is going to be watered down. It is not going to be worth as much. And is it going to be enough to keep her for 30 years? Assuming that I'm going to die soon and she's going to die 30 years later. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you what you could do to protect this country because it was it's it's worth saving it it was a good place to grow up and it was a good place I never regret going to war for it and it was it gave me opportunities uh, but it it's those opportunities uh, are, are kind of faded when you're spoon fed. You, 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 uh, I'm a little bit at a loss with how to add, other than uh, uh, if if you work and the other people don't, it's it, it's I, what, what are you, what's going to happen? They're going to find a way to take it away from you. That's that's the way I see it. Uh, but if 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 you don't work, if nobody works, nothing's going to happen. And, and the whole thing's going to fall apart. So, um, it's a, in my book, it's a sad, sad situation. It, I was born in the roaring, roaring 20s. The first six years of my life, things were really hopping. Then we, then it, we hit the depression a war pulled us out of the depression. And then from that point on, it's been been good. And it's up until COVID-19 hit, we were spinning along pretty good. But uh, it, that's kind of Put things in a little bit of a turmoil, uh, and um, paying people not to work is uh, is causing uh, a serious problem for this this for any country that that does it. 
we we right now we 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 we've been trying to hire people for months uh, cooks uh, lifeguard camp direct people with to handle campers uh, all kinds of jobs uh, if 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 you talk to seven people and they uh, make appointments maybe one will show up and uh, why should they show, why should they come they're getting paid enough to live comfortably without working right now with all the giveaway programs so why work you're not going to make that much more and if you do it's you, you got to pay part of it in taxes so just get the free money and and don't work and and so we got a period of time here where uh, I'm not sure where it's going to end up but uh, it's going to be a lot of problem before you before you it's over sorry but you asked <laughs> Okay, um, and do you have any advice or, like, leading thoughts for me before? Advice for what? For me, or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I don't, I, when I say you know, I, I, you don't know. That's why you're asking. Excuse me. Um. Don't, don't, you're, you're doing part of it. Don't shy away from working. Don't shy away from taking on uh, some project. Uh, of all the people you know, how many of them are doing something like you're doing? No. Not very many. No. So, if, if you don't let them take it away from you, you'll be better off than they are. Uh, it, it, it looks, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, loafing around, having a good time is the better way to go. But sooner or later, that you, you, it runs out. And not, you know, it's, but, uh, while you're while you're doing things that make you uh, some some money, <laughs> you now made a friend. Oh, that's good. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, she'll she'll try to kiss you to death. Oh my goodness! Oh. Well, <laughs> they're worse fates, right? <laughs> Look at that. You. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Um, You're a good girl. <laughs> yeah, don't be afraid to, of the work. Uh, be careful. I don't know how to tell you to be careful, but be careful where you put it. So, the, the, any some of the earnings that you might make, because uh, money makes money. Um, um, if you enjoy work, work things, don't hesitate to do them. Go ahead and do them and enjoy it. Because uh, loafing can get old, and, and, and not only old, but loafing can make you poor. What grade are you in? Ten. Ten. So you have two more in for college? Yep. Yeah. It looks like you'll be able to go to college. Uh, 
Oh, looks like college is going to be free. I don't, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, uh, very few people went to college uh, because of one thing. The war came when when I was I graduated. Like I said, it was February of 40, uh, 41. So it was about 18. January of, would have been 18. Um, it would have been uh, normal to. to Save some money up and go to college in that next fall, if I, if, if if I could. But the war, war came. Uh, uh, came it came along and, and kind of put a uh, put a stop to that. Uh, but. Um, You probably need to go to college these days in order to to, to get the kind of job that will make you successful in, in, in dollars and cents. Uh, if I understand it right, this, this, this schools, the high school education doesn't count for very much anymore. Although uh, we hire we hire a lot of uh, People that uh, that didn't go to college. So uh, stay out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't get caught up in in, in dope or something like that. that's not that's not gonna work. And uh, you'll know what's right and what's wrong. If, but if you if you go, you know, if you know it's wrong, the chances are it'll wind up being killing your your future. So I I'd, I'd stick to the even even if it's a little hard road, stick to the stuff that's. It's legal and and uh, right to do. Did you volunteer for the Navy when you joined? Did you volunteer yeah. with your brother? My brother volunteered, and so did I. Okay. We at different times and did different jobs. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Oh, uh, now I was. I had worked for. A year and a half, I guess it was. I start. I started the day after I got out of school okay. in February, and uh, that was another interesting thing. My graduation present was long underwear, so that I wouldn't get too cold working outside. <laughs> and so, you know, no cars or anything like right. that. So, uh, I, I went to work on a survey crew. On, at the bottom of the ladder, and uh, learned what I could, what I could, and worked my way up. Um, um, and and I've been a. I wouldn't I wouldn't shy away from volunteering. Uh, I've, I've been volunteering for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, Almost like the the first thing after the war, after the war, that uh, when I came home. Uh, I, oh, by the way, uh, while I shortly after I joined the Navy and found out I was going to be at Camp Perry for, instead of going to the South Sea Island, mm -hmm. I got married, and. Uh, 
no, there was a, a, a young a girl, a, a child, when I came back. <laughs> so we, uh, immediately I had to take care of a family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, uh, well, I didn't want to work for somebody. So that was, but what I want to, as soon as the, 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 the uh, one of the children went to um, school, I joined PTA. Okay. And next thing I know, I'm president of the PTA. <laughs> uh, and it's been that way in, in so many things. I was, uh, uh, there was an open shop organization, which is uh, uh, it's still in, in operation. And I became president of the, the Maryland chapter. Uh, open shop is, unions were important, I, I, I guess, when we had sweatshops and things like that. These were, when, when workers were, uh, well, in some countries they chained workers to the to job. I mean, it, was, it was pretty bad, and so the unions got to be uh, uh, helping the workers. But it, it, like a lot of things, it got overburdened, and and and, and now uh, they become a, a almost a business of their own. And and and, and uh, I don't know that. I don't know, like teachers union, uh, I think they're, they're not as, I don't think they're as, as uh, desirous of, of getting you know, a good education as they are to get the, the, the teacher's dues. And that's, that's uh, but, um, So, I just have always been a volunteer. Uh, mm -hmm. Became president of the National Swimming Pool Institute, which is a group of swimming pool builders all over the country. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so, uh, you know, hard work is going to, get you somewhere. Uh, there's always some smarty ready to steal it from you, whatever you heard. Be, you gotta, it's good to learn how to be careful. I'm still trying to learn that. <laughs> uh, there's always somebody got a, something to, to um, sell you or something that's an idea, if it were a thing, which uh, try try to if you can learn what you don't need, as well as what's really good for you. It, these are lessons you'll learn. Um, hopefully, hopefully you learn learn them while they're small lessons, and you're ready for the big ones. The fact that you are doing something that other people are not doing and just interviewing people oh, us, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, you're on the right track. Let's put it that way. I think you're, 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 you're ahead of the majority. Yeah. Thank you. You know, Mr. Rigger, you said a lot of the things that my grandfather would say about watching your money and being careful, and it's nice to hear it again. You don't yeah. hear it very often anymore. So, he'd be, my grandfather served in the Navy as well, but he was, uh, where was he, in like Brazil? Yeah. Yes. He where did. was he? Brazil. Oh. I don't think he, he was a engineer, a mechanic sort of person on a ship. 
It's on the ship named Brazil? No, no. He, sir, he like, he didn't go into... He was in, like, South America so Yeah, during South the America war. during the war. He was? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, he didn't really talk about it, so this is things that I've pieced together. I wonder after why, he, uh, you know. what was going on. Well, now, I know that a lot of Germans wound up in Argentina. Right. But I don't know... Now... Uh -huh. My wife got us to uh, contribute to a, 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 to get a church started in, in Brazil, hmm. which has been very successful. And uh, but that's I've never been there. I've been to Bolivia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we we built an orphanage there. And it's amazing. You've been done some great work. Yeah. But, uh, and he also used, I guess, some of the skills that he learned to come back and do things when he came back. He, like, ran, like, a TV repair shop, and then that became a Honda, you know, sports vehicles, and then, you know, he yeah. built houses, too, you know, and so it just is interesting, you know, you, you take that and you use it for your future. So. Yeah, don't be afraid to launch out. Right. Don't have to be a follower all the time. Yep. Yeah. I think I Jake's doing a great job here doing something I, I, on his own. No one's, you know. I, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I, I think it's great that, that he's, he, you're here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're proud of him, so. And thank you again for meeting with us.